Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. Was out zipping around. It's a nice Saturday morning here in Vegas. Was out zipping around through the canyons. And uh, this is my Porsche 911 Targa. Uh, custom ordered this from Germany like a year ago, and it finally came in like, I don't know, maybe two, three, four months ago. Um, I guess it came in around November, I think, uh, come to think of it. Well, I guess I've had this thing for a little while. Uh, and yes, we wrapped it with Hello Kitty. I custom designed this wrap with uh, going from red to black on one side of the car and then black to red on the other side of the car. The other side of the car is Karomi, uh, another uh, Sanrio character. I'll show uh, that in another video sometime. But so let's go through your top voted questions from <laughs> and also the license plate says hello kitty so let's go through your top voted questions from poll gab the top voted question is from the worst dba who says i have a large table with 50 billion rows it has a partition implemented on it with a column store index. SP Blitz index is suggesting that I add a non-clustered index, but when I do, it slows down my queries. How do I make my queries more performant? So what you probably want to do is go to my Fundamentals of Column Store class. Now, I, I hate giving answers that are just go attend this class, but the reason, one of the many reasons why this is a much more complex problem than it sounds like uh, is that making any changes to a 50 billion row table is terrifying. It's a logged operation, it's going to take forever. Even if you have Enterprise Edition, there's still going to be some blocking involved as a, the index is created. And Column Store isn't right for every kind of workload. Sometimes if you're doing range queries, for example, especially those that involve select star that are grabbing lots of columns, uh, it can be more efficient to have a non-clustered index on there. And not just a non-clustered column store, a non-clustered row store index on there. In that Fundamentals of Column Store class, I teach you the kinds of queries that work well with Column Store, the kinds of queries that do not work well with Column Store, and I teach you strategies on how to pick and choose between those and when to combine them. Uh, it's just about a day long, and it's uh, in my upcoming Fundamentals Week class where I teach a week straight live. So if you wanted to buy it recorded, you can do that. If you want to buy it live, you can do that as well. That's coming up in mid-April. Let's see, next up we have Jack who says, Hi Brent, how do you come up with ideas for blog posts and demos? I liked your recent blog post about index rebuilds with ADR and RCSI. Um, so it depends. Some of them are based on client issues, like when a client has an issue and I think it's one that isn't documented well. Uh, like if I Google to tell the client, you know, here's a blog post I can point you to to solve the problem. I'd always rather give them something that's ready to go and written, but sometimes there isn't one. Sometimes I have to explain to them, all right, here's what the problem is. And then I try to reproduce it in my lab in a way that I can write a blog post for y'all as well as the client kind of kill two birds with one stone. Other times, it's based on me thinking, I bet this is an edge case that would cause a problem, and then coming up with my own creative ways of uh, illustrating it. That ADR blog post was me going, I bet I know a problem. Because somebody was saying, under what circumstances would you not use accelerated database recovery? And I was going, okay, let me come up with some theoretical reasons why. Really, there aren't a lot of reasons uh, that I wouldn't use ADR, other than the simple fact that now the version store lives inside your database. So that's a lot of page churn. It causes problems with differential backups and snapshot backups, stuff like that. That right there is usually a killer for most clients. Uh, next up, Gold says, Hi Brent, forget SQL Server, why not try your hand at gold? Sell it when it's cheap, buy it, buy it when it's cheap, sell it when it's valuable. That is the dumbest question. I, sometimes I read these questions ahead of time, that one I didn't read ahead of time, so that tells you that I don't always get them right. Next up we have John Stake. What a nice screen name, I love it, John Stake says, we have a transactional application that sends the read statements to an RDS read replica. This replica does not auto scale. Do you see any performance advantage when using this architecture, or do you have any advice on how to measure the performance gain? 
So whenever we're talking about read replicas and offloading stuff, what you want to do is look at the weight stats on that readable secondary. How much time is SQL Server spending waiting on that? And what is it waiting on? Is it waiting on CPU? Is it waiting on disk? And so forth. So then whatever those weights are occurring, they are not occurring now over on your primary server. They used to occur on the primary. They no longer do. So if you add together the weight stats across both and you think that you could sustain it all on one replica, then it might be cheaper and easier for you on just one replica instead of offloading them to the secondary. But that's up to you. You know, when you say, how do you measure it? That's weight stats is the way that I measure pretty much everything like that. Next up, QEnt says, Hi Brent, does it make any sense to use in-memory tables instead of row store tables when the data pages in row store are all cached in RAM? Are there any performance differences? Oh man, I suppose I should have started a counter to see how long it was before I uttered the famous words, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Always, whenever you're looking at picking up a tool, ask, why am I picking this tool up? What's the problem that I need to solve with this tool? Don't blindly grab at tools. So the, the problem that in-memory OLTP tables are designed to solve is latch weights. If you're not facing latch contention as your, and I'm not talking in TempDB, if you're not facing latch contention as the primary problem you're trying to solve, then in-memory OLTP tables will do nothing for you. Just like if you don't have a nail that you're trying to drive into a piece of wood, you really shouldn't be picking up a hammer. If you're, the problem that you're trying to solve is screwing a screw into a piece of wood, for example, a hammer is not going to do very good there. The hammer is only going to make things worse, which most of the time, that's what in-memory OLTP does. I don't, I don't really have a problem with in-memory OLTP. The problem that I have with it is, is it's a very, very specialized tool, and Microsoft uh, tended to promote the tool rather than focusing on the problem. And so without educating people on the problem, they're just like, here, grab this tool. And people are like, I have no idea what to do with a chainsaw. And then hilarity ensued. Chris asks, have you ever had to deal with the fallout of a split brain event? Yes, uh, probably half a dozen times in my career. He says, with all of our DR environments, I feel like I should prepare for such an emergency. Are there any tools or techniques you've found helpful? Yes. Uh, go to YouTube, go to uh, the Brenos R Unlimited channel, go to the Senior DBA class. It's a playlist of totally free videos. Um, and in there, there's a series of videos about high availability and disaster recovery. One of them is specifically about split brain scenarios. And I give you a worksheet and you have to prepare, uh, recover from a split brain scenario. And I show you why it's so difficult and talk about what tools you need to solve it. It's all totally free. It's out in the YouTube uh, Brenos R channel, Senior DBA class. Uh, next up, Novocaine says, are the estimates from DBCC CheckDB estimate only reliable? No. My very large database's production DBA is telling us we can't afford to run CheckDB because we can't afford the tempDB hit even on SAN replicas. Oh, I have a, a simple uh, thing then there. What's your disaster recovery scenario? How are you going to recover from disaster? When disaster strikes, when you lose the sand, when you lose your primary cluster, where are you going to recover to? If you don't have one and the business is okay not doing disaster recovery, which happens sometimes, some businesses can't afford disaster recovery, and that's fine, that's their uh, decision. But if you don't have one, then I'm not as worried about it. Then I'll go, okay, well, maybe you can afford to run with scissors. But if you do have one, and most, database, most businesses do have some kind of DR scenario, then go run CheckDB over in your DR environment. Because it doesn't have any workload hitting it right now. And then that's often when people go, well, you know what, we don't really have a DR environment, even though we're supposed to. And then it opens up some fun new discussions. My T got cold says, I'm dropping lots of big tables from a very large database, compressing what is left, and then making it read only. Any tips for shrinking the database afterwards? The data is so cold that I expect post shrink fragmentation to matter. 
what you really want to do then, if it's that, if it's a significant enough of a shrink, like if we're talking like 50% or more, then instead of shrinking it, which is a really slow, single threaded, one 8K page at a time operation, what you really want to do is pipe that data into a new database instead, which is a fast, multi-threaded operation, moving data from one database to another. You can use any number of ETL tools or just plain old T-SQL if you want to. Hammer that data into a brand new, fresh database. You won't have to worry about any fragmentation after that. Just dump the data right in and you're good. Plus, you said that the data is super cold, which means it's not changing, which means that you can afford to take your time to move it into a new database. Uh, next up, April 13th says, can I prove that my SAN makes me do random than, rather than sequential reads? My SAN admin read too much Jonathan Cahayas and is blaming fragmentation for my ills. Rather than going about proving that your SAN is doing something, because now you're talking about proving to your SAN admin something that your SAN is doing. Oh, that's going to be contentious. There's going to be a lot of arguments. Even if you win, they're not going to believe you. Here's what you do. You say, okay, SAN admin, you believe that fragmentation is the root of our problems. Let's take a query. Let's measure its performance. Let's fix fragmentation. Let's run it again. And let's look at its weight stats back and forth. Let's see if that defragmentation fixed the problem in any kind of meaningful way. Make sure you're not dealing with a parameter sniffing problem. Make sure that the plan is the same before and after, because rebuilding indexes will also free the plan cache for that particular table. And as long as that doesn't fix the problem, there's your answer. That way you can go back to the SAN admin and say, well, I did what you said. Here's the before and after. It didn't fix it. Now what? That way, you're not trying to get into your SAN admin's business. That may make it a little easier there. And it may keep them out of your business since it proved that they didn't know how to solve the problem that y'all were talking about. Uh, next up, geopolitically confused DBA says, the recent rise in tensions between the U.S. and Denmark has sparked a discussion of what could happen if the U.S. pulled a plug on cloud services for us. Could something like this happen or am I paranoid? I mean, theoretically speaking, anything could happen. It comes down to what do you think the probability of that is? How likely do you think it'll happen? I'm not in the business of guessing that kind of thing. I just lay it out at management's feet and I say, okay, here's something that could theoretically happen. Theoretically, a cloud provider could go completely down. Theoretically, a cloud provider could be completely unavailable. How much do you want to invest in solving that problem for when it may eventually happen? And it helps to keep it into perspective that you're probably not going to be the world's largest concern if Amazon is suddenly unavailable in your country. If Amazon or Azure or Google or all three is suddenly unavailable in your country, think about everything else that's going to have problems. Banking, uh, electric utilities, all kinds of stuff will suddenly become unavailable and will cause all kinds of problems. If your company falls into those categories, hospitals are a great example. If life-saving, uh, and 9-11 and services are another one, if uh, life-saving measures would suddenly become unavailable in the event that your hosting partner was unavailable, then most companies in that kind of situation, they are already used to doing disaster planning and they build a second data center, or they have on-premises stuff, they have things that they can go put their fingers on, they worry about what happens in the event of a natural disaster, taking out their internet connectivity, all that kind of thing. But if you're Billy Bob's bait and tackle and gun shop, as Aaron Bertrand would say, are you that worried about it? Probably not. You probably just want to get off cloud backups, and that's probably about it. And in the event that you lost a total cloud, because after all, too, you're going to see this stuff coming. You know, you see, like right now, U.S. and Denmark relations are a little janky. 
If it started to significantly escalate, you would see that coming months in advance as we do now, and you could gradually start making preparations that the business was uh, comfortable with. Just on a related note, I mean, I've, I've seen through LinkedIn uh, just a complete decimation of folks working for uh, federal contractors. I would be more worried about your career in this day and age. Uh, career is the wrong word, job. Job is the word that I'm looking for, your current position that you're currently at. Um, that if you're working for a federal contractor, uh, something that is dependent on trade, that, you, that there's never been a better time to start passively looking for work. Uh, to start taking interviews amongst your friends, say, hey, just I want to be aware of what's out there and what's available. Uh, I'm not, my position isn't in danger right now as far as I know, but it always helps to keep these lines of communication open. Because the best time to look for your next job is when you're safely employed at your current job. Because then if you get an offer, you can take your time deciding whether or not you want to take it. You can be really tough on salary and time off negotiations because you've already got a comfortable parachute. You're just looking at some other opportunity that's out there. You'll be in your best negotiating position. You'll be in your best interviewing position because you're not desperate. And you're going up against people who are very desperate and very nervous right now. Uh, also, hugs out there to those who have been affected by all this hot mess that's going on. Hope you feel better out there, too. All right, that's a good round of questions. I will head back out, enjoy the canyon driving out today. It's just a gorgeous uh, 57 degrees here. It's on its way up into the mid-70s, I think, today in Vegas. One of the things I love about Vegas is it's uh, this is the time of year where we get to wear sweatshirts and sweatpants in the uh, evenings, and then very quickly it gets up to t-shirt and swimsuit weather during the day. Hope that y'all had fun. Hope you learned something, and I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.